so okay in this session we're focusing on the economic dimension of agroecology as a, in the last one we were um, touching upon land access and how to common um, land and now we will be focusing on both creating and sustaining agroecological um, local regional economies and also we are going to touch upon some challenges that agroecology initiatives face in creating such projects right so before giving the floor to our amazing speakers that will share their experiences we have uh, some questions that were in the back of our minds when we were um, thinking of this session um, starting by recognizing that green capitalism is taking over and mainstreaming agroecology is uh, has taken it um, and it's in the risk of being co-opted so we ask ourselves how to resist the co-optation right and also what are the compromises that agroecology initiatives can can make a uh, while thinking and engaging in financing finding um, like funding becoming employees or employers in an agroecological project what are the alternatives, costs, benefits, and the implications of all these um, finance uh, and, and material configurations of our projects? What types of markets are we able to engage with in our agroecological projects? Which are the values, the norms, the relationships that sustain the economies that agroecological projects create and fit? how to foster the connections of mutual interdependence and commitment between the households, the farm, the local, the neighborhood, the bioregional, the municipal, the national, the global levels that we need in order to transform our food systems in, in agroecology. And also, uh, one of the questions that we kept from the last session was how to sustain or support livelihoods through agroecology. And we sense that diversification is the key, diversification of economic activities, of know-how, of skills, et cetera. So we think what social organizations are needed to, to configure such diversified and multiple agroecological projects where labor and uh, benefits and costs are more or less evenly distributed. So we when we talk about alternative economies, it becomes somehow tricky and disorienting exercise because we have to recognize both the economic and political context in which we are located and all the mechanisms, uh, but also we are reminded that there are other ways of being and doing, going against the grain of capitalist dominance and also reminding ourselves that those are unfinished, incomplete projects that are not fully outside from the grip of uh, the modern colonial matrices of power. So it's a constant ongoing struggle and a collective creative process that goes on and on and on. So, and also we tend to think of economy as something that is super far away, huge, and that we are unable to truly engage with, something that we feel truly disempowered from, um, that we cannot compatibly interact with in a way, but spoiler alert, we think that we can have an active role in our economies. It's just that we have to unlearn and learn a lot. So we are very excited about this session because we are precisely doing that. Um, and yes, we have a globalized corporate agribusiness that benefits a handful of enterprises worldwide and is enabled by international trade arrangements, is endorsed and legitimized by governments and fueled by consumer societies. And yes, dispossession, displacement of entire communities um, is, are happening in, in the day and, and at the order of the day. Um, and it seems like the agency we are left with in the economy is only to be critical consumers, like voting with our wallets taking the right decisions when we buy or through organized boycotting. While this might be true, um, it is also true that there are more ways to take back the economy. In order to overcome this capital-centric representation of the economy, we must recognize and learn from those other economies that are already in our daily lives and the role we have in them. So those complex and integral ways of making decisions and taking action 
on how we are organizing resources, the people, the times, the spaces, the stories, the knowledge, and how the benefits and costs of the works that reproduce life and societies are distributed once being the center. So this is where taking the, the words of uh, Jacob Gibson Graham, uh, who invites us in their book, uh, Take Back the Economy, An Ethical Guide to Transforming Our Communities. Um, some of these ideas, if you're interested, the, we will share with you some resources. And um, we will dedicate precisely this session to reflect about the economic dimension of agroecology projects through the experiences um, of our speakers. So without further ado, we present you, um, Manu. <laughs> oh, amazing, thank you, Laura. So um, I have the honor to present the speakers today, just to give you an overview. We're going to have Joanna from the Agro Permalab go first and sp speak about agroecology schools. Um, all of these presentations will be reflecting on the economic dimension also in particular. Um, then we'll hear about local circular economies uh, in the context of agro exploitation around Almeria and also uh, from La Bolina, from Selma and Maria from La Bolina. Great pleasure to have them with us again. And also about their experience of going from an eco village to an agro co op. So um, pass, I'm passing the word over to Joanna first. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Really excited to see you. And uh, Joanna is organizing an amazing event series. I don't know if you're going to mention it. I have shared it through our email list by way of propaganda, and I'll pop the link into the chat again now also. Thank Over you. To you. Can you hear me well? Is that okay? Great. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really thrilled to join you and meet you. I hope this connection uh, in the groups will uh, let us to dialogue with each other. I'll go straight to the presentation, but maybe by a word of uh, introduction, I'll just say what perspective I'm representing. I am indeed uh, coming from Agro Permalab uh, Foundation in Poland. We are a training woman-led organization working at the synergy of permaculture and agroecology for full uh, food system transformation. But I'm also uh, here, uh, I could say, representing our Eastern European and Central Asian um, communities of farmers who work together in a, in a community called Bilim. And uh, through that community, we work uh, to develop agroecology schools in our region. I'll jump into the presentation. Oh, uh, could, I, could, I, could you enable me the presentation? Uh, I'm not sure I can do it. Yes. In the meantime, um, maybe I'll say that the perspective uh, that the Europe and Central Asia community of practice on agroecology has grown from represents the work of La Via Campesina, which you may uh, know is uh, one of, it's actually the biggest social uh, movement uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, that work is based on the Nieleni, the Nieleni Declaration on Agroecology, which has been shaped by a uh, number uh, more or less uh, 500 delegates from all over the world in 2015 in Mali, in Africa. And the uh, Agroecology de de Declaration uh, pins uh, 11 pillars of agroecology, which uh, you may know uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, has uh, 10 elements of agroecology. High level of panel of experts by FAO has 11 uh, or sorry, 13 principles of agroecology. The Nieleni movement of food sovereignty has 11 pillars of agroecology, and these are different from those other sets of defining principles in agroecology because they because of few things, and I'd like to point to them. Uh, I will keep it in this mode because it's easier for me to navigate. But uh, one, of, uh, one of the main principles is that agroecology is a way of life and it puts farmers and food producers at the center. And that, uh, that involves uh, equally uh, self-organized markets, uh, taking back control of uh, food system, uh, redefining food as human rights and not as tradable commodity, uh, as well as respecting our indigenous and uh, local traditions. Another very important aspect is the territorial approach, which I'm sure you have already covered. Uh, as well as strong emphasis as knowledge as one of the 
one of the most principal things that we really have to take care of. And when we speak about knowledge, we don't just mean the knowledge in our monoculture uh, mainstream education system. We mean knowledge that, that allows us to address our problems on the ground and take intelligent action. And for that, we organize agroecology schools. This is also why uh, the, those 11 pillars of agroecology uh, defined by Nieleni put a very strong emphasis on collectives and organizations. And uh, it is uh, a priority that both women who uh, take part in almost every segment of food system from, uh, from being majority of population working the fields through uh, cooking, taking care of the ill, et cetera, and raising the next, next generation of uh, farmers. Uh, the, these um, women and youth are central in uh, fostering agroecology that is uh, community, locally based, and uh, built on uh, sovereign uh, self-governed markets. And one more thing that is very important in agroecology schools, which I think uh, can slip away maybe in more academic uh, approaches or um, let's say spaces where which are created to debate uh, agroecology is political programs is that it's really about our relationships and the care we take of each other personally. Um, I would like to maybe mention Scola Campesina because this is where I have first encountered agroecology school in Europe. Um, agri uh, their agroecology schools, you could say, are schools without walls. They are self-organized outside of uh, formal uh, education institutions. Uh, they are strategic places for strengthening uh, agroecology. And um, they take place on farms uh, in communities. They can be pop-up uh, workshops and trainings or they can be long run uh, programs by organizations or by community projects, which also by the way of framing helps to fundraise or show that programs have deliberate direction and uh, display the methodology, which uh, probably will not be foreign to you, which is, which is based on popular education, uh, farmer to farmer, uh, campesino a campesina, and um, different modes of, uh, creating collective reflection for political education and political empowerment. So agroecology schools bridge the technical and political uh, aspect as well as theoretical and practical, but they are very much about bringing a transformation of consciousness. And uh, Scuola Campesina, uh, based in Italy, is an international agroecology school. It is also an advocacy organization uh, that uh, brings together over 20 uh, farmers uh, and community food community or agroecology organizations from Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We meet uh, once a year for uh, about five days to a week long training where we address various uh, scales and uh, topics within agroecology, but we address them and I'll just come back to it through those 11, 11 pillars of agroecology. And, when we, uh, when we spoke about the greenwashing of the term agroecology or um, kind of creating our, uh, you know, uh, creating and maintaining our definitions of uh, agroecology, it is important that we put those values that have been worked out grassroots at the Nieleni um, Forum to the fore and we work uh, through the lens of those pillars. The work of agroecology schools in uh, Europe and Central Asia involves uh, advocating for uh, UN declaration on rights of peasants and other people working in rural areas, uh, as well as uh, continuing uh, building the movement for general food sovereignty and food system transformation. So it is a rights-based approach. Uh, we also have tested uh, and used it as a tool for agroecology schools, something called TAPE, which is a tool for um, a uh, agroecology performance evaluation tape. It's been worked out with FAO and that tool enables to uh, see using uh, elements of agroecology where a farm and a community is in the transition uh, to, uh, to agroecology. So research and action research is also an important tool. 
And uh, going, to, um, going to the main elements of agroecology schools, uh, and I'll go to one more different presentation just to wrap up. Uh, one important thing is that uh, agroecology schools are not, uh, the way we are organizing, are not for individuals. They are not for people just to train in agroecological practice and go on and continue their work on their own. They are to enable whole communities to impact their local food realities. They are for social transformation. They are also based on local needs and uh, local realities. So whilst we have these wide principles, we also, we also need to respect that not uh, all articulations uh, that we have to work to meet the global political uh, discourses will be relevant on the ground. So, uh, for example, in our agroecology schools, we always have uh, translation and people are always encouraged when we meet internationally to speak in their own language. So I'm, I really appreciate there is a translator with us today as well. Um, agriculture schools are also based on local knowledge and farmer knowledge in particular, and that practice that really uh, needs to be brought to consumers uh, because art of farming, uh, and this is bringing back the farmer and food producers to the heart of whenever we talk about agriculture, we put farmers at the center to the, at the expense of limiting voices of those who usually have too much of, uh, of resources to foster their agendas. Of course, agroecology schools are, um, are interstate, inter, you could say, uh, are for different stakeholders and that they invite dialogue of diverse knowledges. But uh, it is important that we give voice to those who know the realities of food production and the challenges of climate, uh, climate crisis and uh, the challenges of local markets changing at the forefront. Uh, I also already mentioned that agriculture schools draw on popular education. This whole model has been developed richly in through La Via Campesina schools in Southern America, as well as in East Asia, in Africa. There are some schools that uh, are doing amazing work. And the, indeed, I'll put, put some links to our um, agriculture schools dialogue series. So you'll be able to um, hear, for example, on Anulita Bumi, the agriculture school in India, or uh, Shashele school in Zimbabwe, they are, by, they are way more developed than what we're doing um, at this embryo stage in, in Europe. And um, agriculture schools are based on horizontal learning pr uh, processes. They can use theater of the oppressed, uh, all kinds of for interactive forms from, you know, ways we use farm as a learning space to um, farm tours, etc., to really enable the knowledge sharing to be horizontal. Um, and maybe one more, one more thing is uh, that indeed the participatory action research is uh, something that uh, sits also at the heart because when we organize agroecology schools we want to work with what is our current challenge and what knowledge we need to to have in order to address it i'm just gonna uh, i'm just gonna go a little bit uh, through a few photos this is um our agroecology school training from may 2022 uh, in italy a few moments. This is um, training of um, Central Asian and Turkish organization in um, Sukraya in, in Turkey. And uh, here's also our group. So we have countries in, in that community ranging from Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, through Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, Moldova, uh, Serbia, Kosovo, uh, Northern Macedonia, uh, and uh, Russia, indigenous groups from Russia. Uh, so this, uh, this is more or less the, the group. I will uh, wrap up here because more we can speak in, the, uh, in, the, in our breakup group. And mm. thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Lots of hearts and claps. 
amazing to hear. Um, I posted the link to um, to your event series also up there. I don't know, uh, is it on Thursday always? It's always on Thursday, right? So do you have the next session tomorrow? Um, I don't know. People can still yes. sign up, right? Um, uh, you can sign up. There's also a free link on the... I will put, put the link here uh, to the main website. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, looking forward to the breakout group about this. Super rich and um, complex. Um, so now, um, as a second input, we have... La Bolina with us again, which is a great pleasure because we thought it's also very nice to go a little bit in depth with some groups and I think we'll get to know your practice quite well now hearing you again. Um, and looking forward to hear your uh, economy related lessons, which are many, I'm sure. Um, I don't know if you'll speak in Spanish or English, but anyways, just hit the interpretation button if you need the translation, everybody. Hi, does everyone hear me? Okay, um, I'm here with La Bolina and I will shortly uh, explain about a research I did on labor mobility in Almeria um, two years ago in order to uh, frame the situation there and contextualize uh, the importance of a decolonial approach in the project we are doing now with La Bolina in Almeria. So this is Almeria. Uh, Almeria houses Europe's largest uh, greenhouse production, also called the Sea of Plastic, as you see why, or the Garden of Europe. And it's a prominent example of how capitalism reinforces large scale uh, extract extraction of both people and land. Um, it is proudly designated as uh, the miracle of Almeria, but what happens under these whitewashed roofs? Um, I will introduce you to, to three persons that are all differently involved in Almeria's production and that I met during my research. And their stories give a small insight in how precarious labor, labor and the incorporation of, of small scale uh, producers into global agriculture uh, is intrinsically linked with exploitation of people who migrated and with racial inequality. Uh, so after this framing, Maria and I will quickly elaborate on how we, with different projects in La Bolina, um, aim to counter these tendencies and uh, question how an agricultural transition can go hand in hand with decolon decolonization of the system and the discourses that exist around it. So I start with the story or a quick insight of Daniel. Um, he's a, a farmer. Daniel, standing in the heat of a greenhouse, a young, Daniel, a young farmer from Almeria, demonstrates the ins and outs of industrial farming. While walking throughout the vast lines of tomato plants, he elaborates on the financial risks he must take as a producer. Being part of Almeria's extensive globalized production chain, he is subjected to the capitalist race to the bottom. Therefore, he states, his costs for labor should be as low as possible. Jose Manuel, a seed grower, grower from El Ejido, shows the immense halls where seeds are germinated to provide for Almeria's farmers. Over the course of his multiple years of experience in agriculture, he has seen Almeria's landscape and methods of production change. Referring, referring to the current scale of Almeria's agriculture and the depopulation of the region, he states that migrant labor has become uh, the, a strict necessity to keep, keep the industry running and wonders how much um, the industry can uh, expand. Spito Mendy, a Senegalese activist who has lived for over 20 years in Almeria, oversees the sea of plastic around his hometown. Doing this, he points out the construction of a neighborhood of luxurious villas. Welcome to the system of in inequality and suffering, he exclaims. He tells that under all these plastic roofs, migrants are working in precarious conditions to generate wealth for the people in these villas. We, the migrants, are the engines of Almeria's countryside, he states. 
So Daniel's, uh, Daniel's story illustrates how industrial and capitalist uh, agriculture results in more risk and less benefit uh, for small scale producers and therefore uh, vulnerability and loss of sovereignty. And this burden is mainly carried by people that migrated as they generally lack uh, rights uh, to con contradict their unfair pays. Jose's, uh, Jose Manuel's observations show how the transition from family businesses to global industry has caused depopulation of Almeria's rural areas and resulted in an increased necessity for cheap and flexible manual labor. Uh, low paid and informal labor of people that migrated has therefore become the backbone of Almeria's miracle. And Spito Mendy in the end, embodies and underlines the essential role of people that migrated in Almeria's agricultural production and points out the systemic nature of race, racial inequality between the people that reap the fruits in Almeria's greenhouses and those who reap the fruits of its capitalized production. So, oh, this is, the picture is gone, but, um, um, this current division of uh, labor and the power dynamics at play in Almeria show the coloniality of contemporary capitalist food production. And this in turn also affects who dominates the discourse on this global production, like whose voices are heard and what remains hidden, what is on the billboards. So as quickly presented two weeks ago, uh, we are currently working on a project in Almeria in which we facilitate grassroots initiatives uh, from people who have migrated and who aim for uh, to change their own situation and uh, for transformative change of the system. And in amplifying unheard voices, uh, we intend to deconstruct and uh, decolonize discourses on Almeria's miracle and create therefore a fertile ground for people who want to take ownership and autonomy over their own situation. And in this or point of departure is that an agricultural transition should go hand in hand with uh, decolon decolonizing the lens through which we look at it and the ways in which we involve ourselves. Um, for further um, explanation about uh, another project, I will give the floor to Maria. So thank you, Selma. So, so, so in La Bolina, we, we give uh, as much importance at creating awareness, uh, advocacy, uh, learning, trainings, as, as in the doing as well. So, so La Bolina, we work with migrants and locals in rural areas of Spain and those depopulated rural areas of Spain, uh, trying to create sustainable livelihoods around regenerative practices. Um, we have used an action uh, research approach to, to our project so that we can search for the best solutions by, by putting things into practice, reflecting on the results and, uh, and going back on testing and prototyping. So this is how we went quickly from an eco-village model uh, that uh, stayed in, the, in an idea uh, phase uh, to an intercultural cooperative uh, model uh, and, and now to the final model uh, that I will call the resilience model. Um, the two first, would, uh, we, we, we moved from those uh, models just because... Um, just because they were either needed a lot of resources or, or didn't meet the needs of, of my, uh, people that have migrated. So, so yeah, and then in, in these models, we have worked with economic, yeah, next, uh, next one. So we have, we have um, the strategies that we have used uh, on alternative economy is localizing the economy and circular models. So the first one within localizing the economy, uh, I'm going to talk first uh, about the short circuit marketing. So if you pass to the next one, it's, that's um, uh, circuitos de comercialización corto. So one of the things that we do as La Bolina is we produce food in a piece of land that has been given to us, and then we also uh, uh, do the commercialization. We not only produce food ourselves, but uh, sorry, we don't not only 
uh, sell produce of, of that we produce, but also of local uh, farmers around us. If you can shift to the next one. So yes, yeah, so not only fresh food, but also processed foods, um, bread, marmalade, wine, beer, all being done and produced by local uh, farmers here in the, in the community. So what we are doing uh, with this model is creating a relationship uh, between the farmer and the consumers and creating community, creating awareness. So that it has a lot, it's not only a, 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 an economic transition and food, uh, a, a food transaction against money, but it is is more than that. So it creates all those things that you were talking about, like mutual interdependence, like support community. Um, for the next one, something that we have tried to apply is the is can, is is localizing the economy by creating circulating the economy within the community. So there is two ways that we can think about uh, in terms of creating wealth. One is like if money is poured into the community so money comes from outside to inside another thing is like if we circulate the the money so if we engage the restaurant or the producers the plumber the shops uh, and we all buy and sell from each other what we are doing is that 100 euros that goes from one to another multiplies its value what we haven't been able to do that in that scale in the community that we live because of um, because of I think resistance uh, with with the, with the local community we're all foreigners there is a lack of trust there. Um, but what we have been able to do is create a network of uh, producers where we have buy and sell collectively and we create seedlings that we can buy from each other. So and then the the other strategy that I wanted to talk about is the the resilience model that we have uh, applied here in La Bolina. So so the the cooperative model didn't didn't succeed because of sustainability issues and also because we couldn't meet the needs of, of farmers uh, uh, migrant farmers in terms of uh, getting their papers you know their, their legal status. So. Um, so the resilience model was based on the creation of, of different small enterprises that could feed each other. So this is a, a, a complex uh, uh, map of how we did it. So we had the veg box scheme, but we create a learning center where actually Joanna was here with us a couple of three or four months ago, where we run residential courses on power and privilege, decolonial practices, Everything related to orga uh, uh, distributed organizational structures. How can we uh, how can we create alternative economies, art and advocacy, all the things that the the project touches on. And so this center buys from the produ producers, um, and the producers can sell so increase the the money. Then we also create other livelihoods such as cooking and caring of the learning center. And then also we have uh, other activities like events, cultural events that we run here. So by creating a, a set of um, businesses, we can kind of like create that circular economy that otherwise <clears throat> that, that is trying to create sustainability and resilience uh, with, within the rural, uh, uh, rural community that we are based in. Yeah, so I'm gonna leave it here for, for time purposes and we can continue this conversation later on. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Maria. If you want to say two or three things more, feel free because uh, Fernando is missing. <laughs> mm. um, so um, I'm not yeah. saying that you have to, but feel free to take a few I minutes mean, to cut yourself short. I think there is a couple of things that I that I've been thinking about in terms of what you were saying about the cooptation of the narrative of agroecology, and I think one of the things that I see missing is 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 a um, a bigger lobby. Uh, from the agroecological uh, enterprises or agroecological projects. Uh, so this network is not so strong here in Spain. So like building um, relationships amongst different th thousands of, uh, of projects that are in Spain. But I think in terms of like time and resources that we have in order to do activism on top of producing, you know, creating awareness for, uh, to increase our markets um, and, and commercializing, so on top of that, uh, you know, going to meetings to create networks, I think is a, is a challenge, but I think networking could be um, a way of bringing back the narrative of agroecology to us. 
And I think also one of the challenges that we have faced and continue facing is funding. So a lot of the, the new funding in terms of tra ecological transitions funding of the European Union, they are not arriving to small, small producers. So you need to have ownership of land, you need to have the money in advance so, so that uh, you have enough coverage in, in case they, they take some money out of you. And, and, that, and then you have to have more than one hectare. So that is creating a barrier for a lot of the small producers that we, that at least I know, and definitely Lavolina. So those are some of the challenges that perhaps we can later talk about um, in response to the questions that you were you were posing. Amazing. I see that um, that Joanna just posted a comment. Um, since our third uh, presenter is missing, I think we should take this as a luck within an unlucky situation as we say in German Glück im Unglück, <laughs> because we win a bit of time to actually have a bit more of a collective conversation and I think today we're 32 Zoom participants so I think we can actually do that um, so please everybody uh, type questions into the chat if you like I think we could use another 15 minutes to have a kind of shared conversation and maybe to kick us off while people type up questions or, or raise their hand also, of course, if you can make an intervention that's short with a question. Maybe, Johanna, can I ask you meanwhile to maybe uh, verbalize what you put into the chat and maybe also talk for like a minute about um, the economic dimension of agroecology schools, share a few more thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, as regards this um, comment by Maria about access to funding based on agroecological principles, well, this will relate to, uh, I think, uh, three uh, types of actors. One is research and academia, second is nonprofits that uh, are doing ecological work, land based, and third is farmers. For the farmers, any type of, uh, for small farmers, we're not talking about commercial um, uh, uh, agro entrepreneurs. For small farmers, access to funding is very complicated. Um, for loans or for subsidies, not only because of the size of the land, what was already said, but also because administratively it's quite complex. So there are specialized uh, firms, for example, that, sub that can support this that process and they take some percentage of uh, labor, oh, sorry, of income coming from, from facilitation uh, of, of access to finance. As regards um, agriculture schools work on, uh, on economy and markets, the, one of the very important accents is uh, autonomy. So farmers autonomy and farm autonomy in terms of uh, input, in terms of technology, uh, in terms of seeds and uh, access to natural resources that sustain the uh, agricultural production, water, healthy soils, uh, sufficient amount of locally managed and produced a natural fertilizer, etc. All this is a very important economic aspect from the production side. So, uh, so skilling up farmers in production methods is, and sharing experiences that work is, in a peer way, farmer to farmer, is one of the very important uh, aspects. And especially um, uh, supporting new entrants to agroecological farmers, getting uh, these kind of ready, know-how for setting up uh, for setting up like market-based uh, production and community supported whether it's uh, community supported agriculture or uh, consumer co-ops that collaborate with network of uh, of uh, of farmers all these models have uh, relevance for for sharing in agriculture schools maybe also important thing is that this uh, when I speak of agriculture schools, I, maybe it sounded quite complex because that work stretches uh, like from the field level of sharing practices and experimenting and um, building autonomy, economic, political, and also building self-governance locally through bioregional kind of model, through advocating up to the FAO or UN and national political level. So different organizations do it to a greater or um, lesser impact and outcome. But if you look, for example, at Romanian organization Eco Ruralis, uh, they've done some amazing work in connecting peasants and uh, stimulating uh, interest in back in the peasant model of agriculture, which is very resourceful 
traditional model of managing local resources. So when we talk about economy, we can't talk only about the global market that is uh, suppressing. We, we know that there's one way that is industrial, uh, industrial farming, monoculture, corporate ownership of patents for seeds uh, um, and biodiversity in general and large environmental destruction. And then there's agroecological way, but we're also talking about this kind of, um, you know, how do we, yeah, how do we self-organize? And Labolina is a great example. Um, I think there, maybe one reply to Maria. What I, what we found like for Polish agroecology uh, kind of catal being catalyzed and network building around this term on the Nieleni principles was having a food sovereignty forum organized in our country. And the first forum was uh, that we attended was in Romania. Uh, so uh, when we when we gather in those food sovereignty fora, let's say 120 organizations from all over the country, and we have panel discussions, but it is really rooted in those principles that I've displayed. Then we are talk. Then we know what we are not talking about, and we know who we are not also inviting to bring uh, contrary agendas because uh, these voices already have a lot of resources to push the, push those narratives forward. Sorry to speak a lot. No, it's great. Thank you. There's two questions in the chat. Um, do you want to post them in voice, Nadine, and get it, or should we read them out? Um, yeah, I can just say it quickly what I wrote because I think you mentioned again FAO and UN and such institutions, and I was curious about the interplay um, or the, the type of cooperations and maybe also the contradictions or constraints that go along with that? I think it's um, with FAO, just to mention ways of supporting. Supporting, It has pretty good knowledge uh, hub uh, space, which if you tap into that, they that takes away some of the mainstreaming effort that for small organization, it's a lot to put all, all, all the software in place or skill up stuff like really for small farmers organization to really show what they're doing once you have someone who's facilitating the, the, that voice it's it just puts our agenda a little bit for, forward they have sponsored really good experiment on that tape tool uh, research on agroecological transition it's a useful tool for us because it's not only about uh, researching objectively the farms but it's also creating a discussion between farmers what's going well what's going hard what's uh, challenging how are we doing on recycling? How are we doing on circular economy? How are we doing on uh, traditional food and our heritage? And it marks it in a relatively objective way so that can bring it to the municipality level or a regional uh, administration. Um, they sponsor webinars and you know symposia and stuff, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard work to stay engage and some people are doing really good work in lobbying for us uh, and on our behalf in those spaces thank you i cannot i don't have too much answer about glyphosate mm -hmm. uh there i think friends of the earth have had last year a big campaign on glyphosate and that's one link that i can point to mm -hmm. get it also just rephrase the question a little bit um uh, now I'm saying what about the use of certifications in production and for market or consumer access, so linked to the glyphosate um, impact, uh, in case you also want to say something to that. And then we have two more questions, um, which I think I would also invite in voice if possible. Can Maybe I ask, is, is the question whether like certification is better because it actually ensures lack of uh, use of chemicals in agricultural production, whereas agroecological, um, just like agroecological model of production without certification doesn't ensure that, let's say, from consumer perspective. Is that the question or something else? I'm not sure I understand it. Because there are uh, there are mm. consumer based uh, certification uh, systems, so cooperatives uh, create their own uh, trust based systems where they go to farms and check uh, for uh, the standards that they define as important, and they can even support a farmer who's um, transitioning out of, let's say, semi natural like chemical supported slightly chemical supported uh, production. You need to understand that. 
farmers have been con really conditioned to, and many are indebted through that conditioning. So it's very hard to trust that uh, that other market, organic, agricultural, will be stable to move out of their current practices. Um, yeah. You want to say something more, or was this some? Um, sorry, because ah. okay. I just wanted to like uh, continue, mm -hmm. just like uh, uh, continue with what Joanna just said, because we are part of um, uh, SPG, Sistema Participativo de Garantía. Um, I don't know the English translation, but I mean, it started in, I think it started in, started in, South, in South America, I think in Peru. And, and there is, it's a system through which uh, trust is being built from consumers and producers. Um, and you can create, as Joanna has said, your own items, your own criteria, which can also and and most likely include social work uh, rights kind of indicators as well. It can also be contextualized. So, for example, if um, if the community or around the community there's no like organic seedlings, then until you until you solve that problem with perhaps uh, create, creating one, creating livelihoods around that, uh, you, you don't put, so you can make this kind of transition. So you would say that it is not necessary that until the, ne the second or third year, you can start uh, transitioning from, from seedlings that are not uh, ecological to seedlings that are ecological or, um, or as Joanna has said, so if there is a farmer that around him has other kind of uh, practices, like how can you support the farmer to transition and then also maybe incorporate those farmers around to create uh, a bigger impact. So, yeah, so this is pretty popular in, I mean, it's, it's widespread, I think, in Spain and definitely in South America. I don't know in other countries. And then, I don't know, there was another question around... I cannot answer about the glyphosate uh, either. So uh, I knew about the campaign that Joanna has mentioned. And then also briefly to say that I, um, I think one of the, the things that for me I've seen, I seen more important how to work towards something is like how, to, how can we create uh, the resources so that we can create, strengthen a network and, and gain back the narrative. And we need to conquer the back again the agroecological narrative and put it um, and put it out in in kind of in a lobby way. I, I would say. I mean, I think in Spain, for example, like the rise of prices uh, in the in the chemical uh, food production uh, has made our products kind of like accessible if, if if you want to go with the narrative that uh, yeah, ecological production is too is too expensive but we are not being able to send that message we so and this is opportunities that have been lost no when with the with the lack of uh, one with the with the, the energetic crisis that we have now we could also be speaking about that uh, in the media we could also be you know like putting for our agenda uh, with the oppor contextual opportunities that we're uh, seeing now, so yeah, like creating a network that ha that has some resources to support the 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 producers, uh, rather than the producers having to do another task to kind of like do this lobbying, do this organizing, do this media work or advocacy work. Thank you. Um, now we got lots of. Um more and dense questions coming in with the chat. Um, maybe we can hear them in person. Um, uh, we could probably discuss them for 20 minutes. Maybe we should rather try and discuss them for like 10 minutes, but um, I think participatory control is a good measure as you described it. Uh, outside of the capitalist system of the certifications, but we need to uh, work on creating our own guarantees. Okay, I hope that works with this translation. I think we'll take the other questions and points too now, if that's okay, because they have been growing. <laughs> and um, we'll hear them, and then we can also bring them with us a bit into the breakout groups. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we have Uwe, Lina, and Laura, and Unai. Unai, I will read out your question since I don't know if, um, is that okay or are you there now? 
Una's question was, what about any experience with local and community currencies? And then, yeah, sorry. Is that you, Una? No, then Bu is, yeah, Bu, go. Um, yeah, sorry, I have a very big question, which is kind of like a, a structural challenge, I think, but it, it's useful just to think about economic horizons, what we're working towards, because obviously the challenge for most agroecological production units right now is simply to, to stabilize markets and, and have the capacity to make enough money to not you know, self-exploit too much and be economically sustainable. Um, but even if we scale that up and there are many units, uh, farms that, uh, that transition to agroecological production, there's still the, the problem that if you do that under market conditions, there'll be a lot of competition between them. Also, if those are cooperatives, um, unless you have like mega cooperatives with monopoly status, um, but I, I think there are historical examples of, of even like in Denmark where I'm from, uh, cooperatives working on market conditions um, on international markets, uh, but also ultimately in Denmark in a way that puts a lot of pressure on, on pushing things to the limit in terms of uh, how you treat um, how you treat other species, how you treat workers, how you treat the land, uh, only within a better regulation paradigm maybe a self-regulation paradigm but still like competition is an issue um so but but mostly the talk in economic terms is, is always about markets uh in my experience so I, i'm just wondering what what your horizons might be or how you would address this question of thinking thinking about um economies that are not market-based um you know whatever that might be commons or different forms of, of planning or coordination or different ways to avoid competition, putting, putting uh, peasants under mutual pressure uh, within that. Uh, is that a challenge we can leave, we don't have to think about now until, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe that's the case um, or maybe you have some thoughts already. Thanks, Bua. If, um, if your um, brains can hold it, then uh, I would still add the other two questions on top, if that's okay. Um, Laura and or Lina, do you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, maybe I go. And I wonder whether your projects suffer from repression, because I wonder, or I think, or I, I don't know, I come up in my head with this, that the more economical autonomous you are, the more repression you would get. This is the connection I have in my head. Maybe it's not true, maybe it is so. Whether you have every, any experience with that. Laura? Um, I just wanted to bring um, like a brainstorming kind of activity for later, or maybe for the break of, but there is this, uh, like there's a lot of unpaid invisibilized work in agriculture and in agroecology, in care work in general. So I was wondering um, what are those specific tasks that you have recognized that could be distributed and integrated within the communities which you are engaged in and if, how have you done that? And this is like really an open question to everyone here. We are all engaged in a pathological project, but I really wanted to ask this to our presenters because you uh, can give us insights on that. How to dedicate and distribute that unpaid and invisibilized work in order not to Holding to self expectation and you no, know, like, yeah, burning out. Thank you. Amazing questions. Um, maybe could I invite you, Maria, Joanna, Selma, to respond 
a little bit and then maybe we still bring also some of the questions with us into the breakout rooms too to go more in depth and talk in smaller groups because sometimes it's also more comfortable to be in a smaller group so um, i will just pass you the mic for a little round and but we will take all this with us also Okay, I'll briefly say local currencies, UNI, it's an amazing tool. Um, it needs time to develop and to be implemented because it, it needs some um, people have to become familiar with it. And also it needs a lot of awareness raising. Uh, there was an um, a explosion of uh, local currencies and community currencies in Spain in 2011, from 2011 to perhaps the 20, 2020s. So there is a lot of uh, experiences that that are uh, very interesting. Uh, some of them have died because of the needs has been has vanished, and some of them continue. So, for example, la cooperativa cooperativa integral catalana um, it is an it's a very interesting experience of an integral cooperative, but also uh, linked with um, with a local currency. I mean, we have the Bristol pound also as an example. So it's an amazing tool to localize the economy. So by using a local currency that you cannot use outside, uh, you are you are uh, you are creating that kind of like circle that I was talking about, where people are selling amongst amongst them and then letting the money stay and circulate in the community. Uh, the second question about um, the horizon, I think I'm, I'm now with a more a reformist mentality. I still think that lobbying uh, and changing policy, legislating, uh, so is 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 the is the kind of like short way that we should uh, kind of push towards. So by changing taxation, perhaps on 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 chemical production, by uh, pro prohibitions, by other legislations, and perhaps including conservation, could be uh, could be tools that in the in the short term we could aim towards. Um, repression, I think at a small scale, uh, what we see is when we start growing, uh, we, 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 the neighbors bring the police, the local, you know, so, some people, so, some neighbors that are against our uh, intervention bring the police. So we start being a, a threat for some kind of system. And, and I think in the larger scale, we see cooptation, we see greenwashing. So yeah, I think uh, we see in, in a smaller scale that kind of repression, but it is not so so strong in, in our small community. And I think the last thing is we have introduced the, the ideas of ecofeminism to think about care economy and activist economy as well. So participation, which also is included in, in ecofeminist perspectives. But I can talk about that maybe later on. I'm not so much uh, involved in the agroecological strength of La Bolina, so um, I don't feel in the position to, to uh, in that answer on these questions. So I'll uh, give the floor to you, Joanna. Okay, and uh, it's been a great comment on currencies and I'm not so strong uh, on that level, but I'd say that in local economy, you, as was said, uh, not only the money circulates, uh, and increases the value, but also you can have more barter of different things or related to the question on competition for uh, space in the market and sales uh, for small for smallholder uh, produ producers. Uh, when uh, producers also share uh, knowledge sharing, develop together uh, technologies for the market, uh, which you can listen on this, uh, you can listen about this in the first dialogue in our series with uh, Chuki Nanjunda Swami from India. She talks about how uh, there the farmers are creating their own local markets. There, there are they are many, but the, they are not only selling produce. They are starting to develop all kinds of uh, uh, intermediate products that support those markets existing and developing from uh, you know weaving different uh, items that store things to uh, to preserving so that's like a kind of more on the women's side for example uh, developing uh, long uh, and added value products 
I would say about the competition also that the issue is not the competition itself for me because uh, it, it's the it's what drives the competitions and what are the uh, what is the what are the what is the type of hierarchy existing? Is it uh, is it that we are driven by excellence and creating quality for that improves our lives, or is it driven by profit and greed? That's one kind of layer that I would approach it because competition for excellence and quality of well-being for everyone that will drive us to having incredible experience and uh, improving uh, our way of looking, you know, improving our craft basically. And the other thing is, if we have um, power domination hierarchies, so not natural hierarchies, we where uh, we already have discrepancies in our momentary capacity. One mom one year we are producing better uh, better tomato, another year worse, and someone else is better. I mean, this over over long time, it all equals out. But when we have domination hierarchies, which we have in current market, a neoliberal market model where systemically uh, you have like so systemically you are incapacitated from participating because you have to have a legalized kitchen in a in your household i mean this was not an issue uh, you know 50 years ago you would just produce in your kitchen in poland you can still produce in your kitchen for a uh, market sale but it has to be registered kitchen but you don't have to have you know a hygiene inspectorate coming to you and checking you which is a requirement created by big industry because the because the chain because the chain between the consumer and the producer is so long that it's impossible to actually uh, maintain a trust based system so when you don't have trust you can't enjoy competition because you know someone's exploiting you or someone else in the in the middle and on the monopoly uh, sorry on the certification i I personally would like not to have certification. It's a burden for uh, for farm for organic farmers, and it's a burden that they pay in in spending their time on bureaucracy rather than uh, on improving uh, quality of their fields and soil and plants and their own lives, and having time for holiday, for example. And uh, because this burden and that cost should be on the industrial player, on the one who is actually creating cost, uh, but that cost is here. So, but in terms, I think the question was more that over time that certification gets devalued and people stop trusting it. And uh, uh, I, I, in that way, I still think that the certification system is important, but we do have now basically big monopolies. And I think like the American model where you have like just, you know, the organic certification is kept like at the minimum standard just to have it certified. And it doesn't increase the biodiversity element. It doesn't create a, a circular economy. It does, I mean, all these agroecological pillars are missing the social, political, economic. So the certification system is just to maintain a technologically sound, uh, environmentally healthy uh, standards, but it's not to, look at the quality of labor rights or um, you know quality of education right to education for farmer to continue lifelong learning for example to have time for these kind of things so yeah it's a um, uh, certification itself is good we need it and i think austrian model from what i heard i've never been austrian and austrian model uh, you can check out work of arkanoa they do really uh, so it's a seed um it's a seed savers association of 14, over, over 14,000 uh, people. They do amazing work because they actually, for years now, more than 30 years, have developed uh, local food markets based on all the varieties. And supermarkets have to have at the forefront uh, shelves that display um, products of local origin. And they can be certified, but they don't. The, the main thing is that they are locally produced. They are uh, they are uh, heritage varieties or local varieties, and uh, they have a story. So uh, I'm not sure. I miss. I I don't have experience of repression. I would say I have some experience. It's kind of worrying of competing for agroecology, and I mean this is like. Uh, you know that and uh, in a kind of NGO sector like 
there isn't enough communication or there isn't enough sense that we are working for the same cause. So you find people starting their project with a, and duplicating, for example. So we don't have enough communication to not do the same. We have so many, so few resources and then we duplicate, for example. So without this sense of, okay, we are talking about the same vision, we share the values principally, we, we respect our diversity. So it's not like we want to now centralize, you know, nonprofits or grassroots. Uh, community initiatives, but like we need some fora to communicate. And in that way that links to the competition and um, a kind of, uh, yeah, like fight for agroecological narrative, maybe. And uh, I'm posting one more thing on academia. We've had a research that uh, we don't use it enough, but like it was really great to have a research done on three of our, let's say, food sovereignty, agroecology training organizations. And it, that research is kind of showing actually, yeah, these grassroots initiatives are doing great work and they have some issues as well. And, uh, you know, it's like a, a, a research, good research and honest research can help us to show our own contradictions and our, um, when we are a little bit wrapped up in our ideological uh, narrative. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for these um, amazing answers. Um, um, very useful. I think I rem will remember it for a long time that the impact academia has is to have an emancipatory clarification on the work you are doing. And the other question was about um, how you can have organic products that are affordable for everyone and still have dignified wages for the producers. And Joanna was um, answering that in the sense that there are different ways of giving back to community as well. And um, having, for example, this circular um, economy or having, um, well, I really, really feel rushed, having workers in your projects to um, have um, a different status um, legally or um, yeah, offering your space and giving access in many different ways. I think this were the main topics and just in short. And probably I forgot a lot. So if there's something important you want to mention, please mention. No, that was an amazing brief summary, I think. Um, who took notes in the group or in the main room? Who would? I, I took notes. I can give you a quick overview on, yeah, like we started off talking about um, the different experiences we have um, of who actually has access to community support, uh, community supported agriculture and how you can also target different groups of people. But um, what this actually implies if you want to target a bigger group and if you then if this is the kind of work you want to do. Um, we had this as example of like, when you, for example, try to aesthetically please more middle-class, higher-class people, your work and your um, expectation, the expectations to your work also change. And um, sometimes people also choose community-supported agriculture because they like the principle of not being perfect or not um, re re receiving like yeah perfect uh, no, vegetables or um, yeah and um, are committed to that so money and principles are um, important factors here um, and then our discussion switched a bit more to um, how we can um, exchange or um, it was more about around the question of certification, I would say, and how to enable each other. Um, because you might not, with such uh, initiatives, you might not get the certification from, from a higher institution and how you can build that power um, between um, different cooperatives and um, yeah, then build, build trust or exchange um, knowledge on agricultural practices so yeah i hope this is it but the others can also add things if i forgot something important thank you nadine is it okay uh, to leave it at that or does anybody want to jump in good okay um 
I have this terrible. Um, yeah. Yes, we had a brief discussion with Inland with Maybe we can share, um, Emma and Emil will share something about our short discussion. Yeah, uh, we can give a, a little tiny summary. Uh, we talked mainly about uh, what uh, Anthony and, and Jean do for Finland and in Sardinia. Um, um, about the yeah, the way that they are trying to connect uh, knowledge from uh, the I guess from the urban intersect maybe more than we think or can influence each other more than we think. I thought it was really interesting that you were exploring a lot the these questions through art, um, so connecting art and culture and agroecology and the rural, which is often quite excluded from this space that that stays in the in the cities, and. Um, what else? Yeah, talking about like neo rurality or the contemporary rural. What does it mean to be rural today? Like, what practices do people have? What meanings do they make for themselves? Do you want to add something? Yeah, maybe another question is a bit how do we like avoid this romanticization as well of the rural? And we do work focusing on regenerating the, the, the very idea of the rural and, and the rural itself and reinvigorating it to adapt it to a modernity that is different to what was in the past. Um, and then also more specifically, uh, they explained that Inland was born in 2018, I think, in Madrid, and that they have several projects in Spain, uh, in Mallorca, and in the north in Asturias. Um, and from for various months, they traveled to really look at exhibitions around Europe uh, that were connecting agriculture um, to in these urban contemporary metropolitan spaces like Newcastle and somewhere else in Germany. Uh, but they're going to leave links in the Jamboard so everyone can see them as well. 